thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Um, so, firstly, welcome to everyone who's joined us physically here today in our tips offices, as well as uh, our attendees who are online uh, and, uh, and and joining us from the comforts of their laptops. So, my name is Mohammed Patel. I'm a senior economist uh, here at TIPS, and I work in our sustainable growth uh, area of work. Um, I'd like to in, in, uh, welcome you all to our development dialogue today, which is centered on uh, green hydrogen and industrial policy. Now, we, I'm sure most of us know that green hydrogen has become quite popular uh, as a theme in the past couple of years. Uh, since around 2019, we've really seen a, a sort of global surge in the interest in green hydrogen from various points, um, from a decarbonization point, uh, from a just transition point, uh, you know, when we think about energy systems and how we plan our energy systems, there's been a lot of uh, thinking around green hydrogen there as well. So today, we're specifically zeroing in on green hydrogen and industrial policy. So we want to try and understand, firstly, what's the current view on green hydrogen? What are the, what are the different viewpoints? How is green hydrogen rolling out in South Africa? And uh, what the utility or importance of, of this technology and the development of the global, uh, the development of the value chain in South Africa? Uh, so you know, what do we think of the development and how do we see that panning uh, So for today, I'm going to be, uh, your moderator, and I'm also going to do a small input at the beginning. Uh, but before we dive into that, just a bit of a, uh, an overview of, of today's session. We're going to be running our session until four o'clock. Uh, from now until around three thirty, we're going to have inputs by our various speakers. Uh, two of us are here physically. Two of our speakers are going to do uh, virtual inputs. Uh, that takes us to 3.30, after which we'll open the floor, both physically and, uh, and virtually, uh, to take some questions and to, and to, and to discuss, uh, discuss the inputs and discuss our views. Um, so with that being said, I'd, I'd just like to uh, briefly introduce uh, our speakers. So I'll do the introduction at the beginning, uh, and then we'll have our speakers do their inputs. Uh, so while well, I'm just bringing up my introductions here. So firstly, I've introduced myself already. I'm a senior economist here at TIPS. I've done uh, research work around green hydrogen for the last uh, two to three years. Uh, we've looked at it from a policy perspective, from a decarbonization perspective, from a techno-economic perspective, uh, through various projects and, uh, and research work. Joining us here today as well is Jason Bell. Jason Bell is an economist and researcher at CRED, so the Center for Competition Regulation and Economic Development. His interests lie in political economy and industrial development issues focusing on the role of regulation, governments and institutions uh, in corporate growth and the evolution of distribution of power. We're also joined by Bruce Young, who is a senior lecturer at the Africa Energy Leadership Center at uh, the Business, business School. He's a chemical engineer with uh, broadly based business development and technical experience and expertise related to the global petrochemical industry with specific expertise uh, in petrochemicals. We're also joined uh, internationally by our colleague, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, Soren Scholven who is a professor at the Department of Economics at the Catholic University of the North in Chile. Uh, he's affiliated with the Policy Research in International Services and Manufacturing, the PRISM unit at uh, UCT. Uh, Soren's research interests are extractive. In um, so, while the, so while the screen is loading, um, so as I said in the beginning, green hydrogen has been uh, the sort of flavor of the day for the last couple of years. And the reason for that uh, is that there was a, a key uh, report by the International Energy Agency that really put green hydrogen on the map. Um, the idea was to present green hydrogen as a decarbonization option with uh, utility in a number of uh, downstream sectors or downstream value chains. And right at the, at the, at the center was 
the idea or the argument that green hydrogen can help with decarbonizing traditionally hard to decarbonize sectors. So we're talking about iron and steel, uh, petrochemicals, cement, etc. cetera. Um, so at the time, it, it was the case that the technology, alternative technologies could take decarbonization only so far, and green hydrogen was the only option for further and deeper decarbonizations, particularly in these, uh, in these value chains. So based off of that, um, there was this global surge and interest in, in green hydrogen uh, as a theme. Now, a point to note is that electrolysis, which is the heart of the electrolyzer, the, the, the process that, that converts uh, water uh, through energy and put into, into hydrogen and oxygen, uh, that process has been understood for a long time. Uh, however, around 2019, 2020, we know that there was a growing pressure for, for countries to decarbonize uh, their, their value chains. And we know that with increased penetration of renewable energy generation, which is an input into green hydrogen production, the costs of generating renewable energy were, were, were falling as more and more uh, renewable energy uh, generation installation is happening globally. So the combination of those factors really brought green hydrogen forward in that here's a potential uh, decarbonization option and also a sort of beneficiation of renewable energy. So um, my, my slide here basically uh, sort of explains what I've just said. Um, there's also other benefits that have been advocated for green hydrogen, like energy security uh, within countries. Um, South Africa, in the, in, the, in the context of that, of those global dynamics, uh, was seen as having some, some key capabilities and advantages to, to sort of insert into this uh, potential global green hydrogen marketplace. And some of those uh, advantages uh, are around our renewable energy resources, specifically our solar resources and wind resources, combined with uh, access to platinum, which South Africa has a lot of reserves of, and I'll come to uh, where platinum fits in the story for those that aren't aware. And combined with that is access to the Fisher Crops technology that's really imbibed mainly with wood and sasso. Uh, so the understanding of the coal to liquids technology and how that can be integrated uh, with green hydrogen in the existing uh, hydrogen uh, streams that, 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 that are already are there. Uh, so on the, on the basis of that, um, there was the idea that green hydrogen presents an opportunity to create a new and sustainable value chain in South Africa, uh, both for domestic decarbonization as well as a uh, export uh, export commodity into a, a into a world that's increasingly likely to demand green hydrogen. Okay, so this is just a very very basic basic diagram uh, of of the process, and it obviously gets much more. Uh, technical than this, but it's just for to illustrate a simple understanding. Um, so, so, so the basic idea of the electrolysis process is that we have the electrolyzer, which is uh, the heart of the process, and uh, into the electrolyzer uh, we feed water, H2O, and you have an electricity input, an energy input that goes in. And this sort of breaks up or liberates uh, hydrogen and oxygen that comes out. So this is the electrolysis process. When the electricity input is a renewable input, a low carbon input from solar or wind generation, then the hydrogen is low carbon or clean hydrogen uh, in, in this case. So in terms of the technologies that are available uh, based on a on a review of, uh, of, of the literature, um, there's three sort of um, three technologies, you can call them groups of technologies uh, on, the, on the electrolysis side. There's the sort of incumbent alkaline electrolysis, um, which is shown on the left. There's the proton exchange membrane, which is shown in the middle. And there's the sort of newer technology that's still under development, uh, which is the solid oxide electrolysis cell. Now, there's a lot of information on the side. I don't want to get drowned by the information, but it's just showing some of the key differences between the technologies. So, uh, you know, the temperature at which it operates, the efficiency of the process, 
the plant footprint, how much space uh, is taken up uh, by, by the equipment and the capital expenditure. A point to note here is that uh, the proton exchange membrane, the PEM based technology, has some advantages, specifically around modularity. Uh, so you, it's 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 more it's easier to scale uh, PEM based systems compared to alkaline electrolysis. So um, the PEM based systems have been getting a lot of attention, and a lot of the installations uh, in the recent past have been using the PEM based uh, technology. Uh, and that's illustrated here on the left. Um, so this is taken from the International Energy Agency. And you can see the jump in, in PEM-based installations from the 2010 to 2014 period to the 2014 to 2019 period. You see a market rise in the share uh, of, of, of PEM-based uh, electrolysis systems. On the right-hand side, uh, we see an indication of uh, growing uh, electrolysis uh, plants. Um, so again, here comparing the 2010 to 2014 time period to the 2015 to 2019 time period, you see a significant rise in the size of the electrolysis as well. Now, this is a more newer slide, and I apologize if the text is a bit small, but it's a, I think it's an important point. So one of the challenges of that um, that comes up in the in the when we when discussing green hydrogen, uh, and this is. Uh, not unique to green hydrogen in a lot of sustainable, uh, in a lot of value chains where you see transition towards lower carbon technologies, you, the lower carbon technology is competing with an incumbent technology. Uh, in this case, it's competing with uh, gray hydrogen, so hydrogen that's produced from natural gas. Um, and currently, green hydrogen uh, sits in that three to six dollars per kilogram of hydrogen produced range. We contrast this with gray hydrogen, which sits around one dollar to one and a half dollar uh, per kilogram of hydrogen, depending on the source, obviously depending on the energy cost and where uh, where the plant is located. But that's a sort of rough indicator of the price differential. So, in a lot of the literature, you see you see you see the discussion center around this. Just a, just a quick comment. That's at the factory gate, not the load. Hundred percent. At the factory gate. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, clarification. So at the factory gate, uh, not including transport costs, which will add another layer uh, onto those costs. So these are the. Uh, this is a rough comparison of the production costs. And when you look at the trajectory, so where some of the cost declines are anticipated to come from, the significant declines center around your electrolyzer costs. Which is shown by the first uh, gray block on the right of the blue block. The second is electricity costs, the cost of your electricity inputs. And the third is the efficiency of your electrolyzer. That's not to say that there aren't other factors that impact the price and where other declines are going to be, but those are the main factors uh, that, are, that are regarded as contributing to uh, the declines in, in, the, in, the, in the cost. So, I'm sorry, just to say, I know it's important with sourcing, just to say this is a source from, from the International Renewable Energy Agency from a recent report in 2024, and that can be made available. Uh, so those are some of the dynamics when we look at uh, price, when we look at some of the um, advantages that South Africa has and where, where the thinking is going. In terms of South African hydrogen supply, uh, some of the main players in the marketplace, obviously Sasso produces uh, the fissure trucks process to uh, to produce grey hydrogen. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, it's around 2.7, 2.8 million tons per annum, but a lot of which is uh, reserved internally within their production processes. Other players are Afrox, uh, El Quid. And, but uh, all commercial production is currently based on, on natural gas and coal, uh, so fossil based inputs. Uh, currently, there's no commercial production in the country. Um, so, I think I've already spoken to this, and uh, you know, the, the three main advantages that are presented for South Africa are solar uh, the renewable energy resources, the access to the fissure crops technology. Uh, the access to platinum resources. There are other advantages as well. So specifically, when we're talking about export markets, 
South Africa has a long coastline uh, with ports uh, along that coastline. Uh, so that's presented as another uh, advantage that's export specific. Now, this uh, sort of was the heart of the, of, the, of the paper that we did, and it was trying to understand, so where can, should, should there be an export market? Where could South Africa potentially, in, 20, in a 2019 world, land uh, green hydrogen? So this is at that time. So at the time, and it's still, uh, in terms of the demand from countries, it's still, uh, uh, it's still accurate, it's still consistent. So there were three uh, main uh, sort of countries slash trading blocks that were seen as, as key uh, trade partners, Japan, South Korea, and the European Union. Germany has sort of uh, taken a much more prominent position uh, within the EU uh, as it demanded for green hydrogen, but those were the three countries. Uh, in terms of uh, updating the data, so this is a more uh, a recent uh, figure, and this is just also illustrative of the, uh, of the global interest uh, in, in green hydrogen. There's been a market rise in the number of hydrogen strategies, so countries that are uh, looking at uh, developing green hydrogen within the economies uh, as shown in this slide. And you can see from 2017 to 2023, there's a, there's a significant rise in the number of countries that have published green hydrogen strategies. Cool. Another point of contact, uh, here is a diagram uh, sourced from the IEA around uh, the announcement of hydrogen production product or projects. So these range from uh, conception, feasibility, uh, under construction, and operational. Uh, I mean, we see South Africa here, we still sort of early stage feasibility projects, and we, you know, there's been a number of announcements, and we'll, we'll track some of them in the presentation as well. Uh, but this just gives you a, a global picture of, of how this is sort of panning out, and specifically on the, around the, the interest in, in the technology. Ooh, next slide, sorry. Exactly. Okay, so so we zeroed in on three countries, such so as Japan, uh, South Korea, and the EU. So firstly, Japan, uh, you know, there's been a number of policy documents, uh, specifically the strategic roadmap for hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, also the basic hydrogen strategy. And in essence, Japan was signaling to the international market that uh, we want green hydrogen for domestic decarbonization, and we're willing to import it. Uh, that number at the time was uh, indicated as 300,000 tons per annum by 2030, ramping up uh, to 5 to 10 million tons per annum uh, beyond 2030. Uh, in that case, also, uh, there was a just sort of staged approach by Japan. So initially, there was an allowance for the import of gray hydrogen, but slowly over time, transitioning towards uh, more low carbon hydrogen. The next, uh, the next country was South Korea. And here too, uh, import demand for domestic decarbonization. Uh, this was through the National Basic Plan for New and Renewable Energy, uh, re New and Renewable Energies, uh, as well as the National Roadmap for Hydrogen Technology Development. So here too, uh, import demand uh, was uh, signaled at around 300,000 300, tons per annum by 2030, and ramping it up to 1 million tons per annum by 2040. Finally, uh, the EU, through the hydrogen strategy, and there have been subsequent developments since this, um, also signaled uh, to import green hydrogen into the, into the trading block. Um, importantly, there was a specific um, mention of uh, a focus on the African Union uh, through, through the framework of the Africa European Energy Initiative. Uh, so specifically in that document, uh, African countries were highlighted uh, as uh, potential trading partners. Uh, obviously, a lot of focus on the North African countries, Morocco, Morocco for example, but uh, including So, um, coming to today, which is some years after that research, uh, what we see is that the, there are growing connections between countries and countries. Are, uh, and we made the argument in the paper as well, the countries are positioning themselves in this world. Uh, based on their willingness to accept the technology. Now, there's a number of colors in this diagram. Um, green indicates countries that uh, want to export green hydrogen to global marketplace. So that Africa is sitting here. Blue countries are indicative of countries that want to import green hydrogen. 
And the sort of peach color of this country is somewhere in the middle. So they haven't indicated uh, willingness to export. They haven't indicated a strong willingness to import. They're sort of trying to go about it on a self reliant route to develop domestic capabilities and absorb the technology within their countries. So this picture is purely illustrating uh, the sort of interconnectedness between countries that's sort of emerging around green hydrogen. Uh, there's been a lot of initiatives uh, like MOUs, for example, uh, Germany's signed a number of MOUs with different countries uh, to, to try and get this trade relationship. Now, coming back to South Africa, so given that this is technology, this is the sort of state of the global progression, uh, what if, how is this sort of unfolded in South Africa? Um, so as a starting point, South Africa had the HISA program, which has been around since, I don't know, if memory serves correctly, since around 2007. Uh, and that has consisted of a number of units to look at uh, developing uh, electrolyzer, uh, capacity, uh, looking at R&D into different components uh, of, of electrolyzers, uh, and basically trying to bring the technology to South Africa from South Africa, right? Uh, on the back of all of that development, DSI uh, really spearheaded the development of the South African Hydrogen Society Roadmap. Uh, the roadmap is seen as a sort of first document, uh, or, or, the, or the first, uh, you know, uh, national pathway, if you can call it that, to green hydrogen development within countries. Uh, so it was seen as a sort of imperative to, to get this mainstream within the South African discourse. Uh, it addresses a number of uh, uh, themes within green hydrogen, uh, decarbonization of transport sectors, uh, decarbonization of energy intensive industry, the creation of an export market, uh, creation of a center of excellence in manufacturing, uh, specifically for the components in electrolytes and fuel cells, uh, power sector uh, reform, and hydrogen generation, storage, and distribution. Um, so these are some of the outcomes that were identified within the Hydrogen Society Roadmap. The document is fairly long. It covers a lot of detail. So uh, if you do want to learn more about it, I highly recommend that you go through it. But this is sort of sort of the high-level outcomes that are identified in the roadmap. Uh, and the important part, there, again, to emphasize is that the roadmap is seen as, as a first sort of signal to the international market that, you know, as a country, we take it seriously. So this is what South Africa has developed so far. Then we have the commercialization strategy, which followed um, and you know, developed, uh, led by the IDC, involving ETIC, DSI, and various other stakeholders. Uh, it was approved by cabinet in 2023. And to highlight some of the main themes that were dealt with in that report, uh, it, it basically identifies a roadmap uh, until uh, 2050. Uh, and it looks at a number of key themes that have uh, surfaced within the South African discourse. So it relates to demand, both domestically and from an export perspective. Uh, it looks at the value chain and the extent to which South Africa is involved in, in that value chain. Uh, it looks at infrastructure, specifically uh, the need for port infrastructure and pipeline infrastructure. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to that uh, at some point, and specifically the point that was mentioned on transport. Uh, it looked at hub development and the hubs. Uh, hubs are seen as a hubs are seen as a sort of initiative to catalyze the green hydrogen economy, specifically as it reduces transport costs. So you have a supplier and a consumer within close geographical proximity to each other, so that you reduce transport costs and you can start building up that green hydrogen uh, business case. Um, and then it also sets up a roadmap for catalytic projects and the required actions by various stakeholders to, to, to realize uh, those projects and to realize uh, those goals. I'm sorry, can I just skip to the next slide? Yeah. Um, another important um, development uh, was the gazetting of green hydrogen projects. So in 2022, Minister Patricia Dolo gazetted nine hydrogen projects. These projects uh, vary in, the, in, in geography, so they're across the country, and they also vary in terms of where along the value chain they sit. Uh, 
Uh, some of them involve the production of ammonia, for example, which is a beneficiated product from green hydrogen. Uh, some of them develop downstream, uh, uh, testing downstream test cases. So, for example, Cecil Highship, which is well known, uh, is testing the production of sustainable aviation fuel in Secunda. Um, you know, the hydrogen valley program is looking at uh, heavy user trucking, mobility using green hydrogen. So, so these projects really are uh, dispersed across the value chain and dispersed geographically. Uh, another important development in the, in the domestic context. Finally, uh, one cannot discuss green hydrogen without talking about the jet IP. I think if I left this out, someone would have asked about it. Uh, so I have to include it. Uh, and it's important to note that um, in the 2023 to 2027 uh, uh, jet IP package, is a provision of 319 billion for green hydrogen development. This was prior to uh, some of the newer countries. This was prior to some of the newer countries. Sorry, one time. This was prior to some of the, the, the newer countries in 2023 uh, pledging more additional funding uh, to, the, to the package. So in 2023, we saw the Netherlands and Spain also uh, pledge uh, additional funding, which raised the total quantum of funding. Now remember, this is not only green hydrogen, it also involves uh, just transition activities as well as uh, electric vehicles. So it's... So it's moved, uh, it's, it's moved the total funding from around 8 billion um, to, to, to 11 billion. Next slide. Ah. You can go to the next one. So, so, so I think that sort of sets the landscape. Uh, that's not all there is to it, which is why we have other presenters here as well. Uh, I'm going to do a shameless plug, uh, but, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and I think it's also important in terms of uh, the scene setting. We're currently doing some work around the interplay between green hydrogen and the just transition. So here, this is also another important topic. And what I forgot to mention was that the just transition features prominently as a theme within both the Hydrogen Society Roadmap as well as the commercialization strategy. So from a policy perspective, it's been identified as something that's important to take cognizance of. And we're trying to understand now in some of the research that we're doing, how, that, how, how these two themes, so green hydrogen development on one hand, and the just transition on the other hand, actually merge and work together. We know that over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of uh, talk and discussion about clean hydrogen and the role that it can play in the just transition. But what we're trying to understand is how this actually unfolds at a project level. Uh, so we're taking the gazetted projects and we're looking exactly at how project developers are absorbing just transition principles into these projects. So the idea is to add to the discourse there uh, around that. But I think I, I'll leave it at that for now. I don't want to spend too much of time talking. We do have other consensus here as well. But I think that sort of sets the scene for for, for what we're talking about today uh, and some of the discussions that are likely to come up. So given that, I'm going to hand over uh, to my colleague who's going to be taking over um, the next presentation. Uh, and that's Jason Bell, who I introduced to So if you can just load Jason's paper and we can get him to present on that. All right, awesome. Thank you, Mohammed, for a really interesting uh, first go at contextualizing many of the issues. Uh, you attack some of the scientific stuff that I'm very much not uh, educated to address, but I'll try and do my best from our industrial policy side to offer some crucial insights. So this input is a very much an abridged version of a, a much larger presentation uh, of a working paper that was released in two, uh, 2023 last year, uh, co-written by Antonio Andrioni and uh, Professor Simon Roberts. It builds off Clint's growing body of work around green industrial development issues aimed at tackling climate change problems while also looking to set an agenda for a much needed and, you know, how we tend to look at these things at deeper sectoral level 
uh, investigation to complement uh, many of the high level issues that are discussed in this larger working paper, but also I guess will be presented today and are currently floating around the, the different discourses. Now we frame this paper as a way to kind of lever, create into the green hydrogen debate, uh, utilizing our, I guess our, hopefully by our well-known focus on structural transformation, industrial linkages, productive capabilities, and of course, focusing on trying to uh, prioritize downstream diversification. So just to provide an overview of some of the core issues at hand, and Mohammed touched on a few of these, but you know, just to provide some of the context that we were looking at uh, when starting to write this paper, the global economy's stark inequalities are further being unearthed by climate change crisis. We know that um, already developed economies have significantly bad industrialization records focused on uh, high emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And this dirty industrialization records really set the scene for why this global shift and transition to a greener economic outcome in many ways driven in some degree by a green hydrogen uh, promotion strategy. Now, as time has passed, consumer and activist sentiments have, of course, driven the need and uh, driven a flurry of these climate change-related policies that have, like Mohammed said, been adopted, debated, and designed uh, mostly in the global north, with some examples of the global south also uh, taking a stab at these uh, types of policies. Now, because of this, South Africa, given its own contribution to the poor state of the global climate and its own high emissions, is, of course, a risk at risk of being a victim of these global shifts. So then we try and ask, and at least use in this paper, we are trying to see how if how we react to the problems of climate change and how our high CO2 emissions, uh, how these reactions significantly have impact, implications for our future industrial competition and of course trade policies in this new era of green transitions and green economies. In particular for developing economies with significantly fewer resources and capabilities the problems from unabated emissions could very much exacerbate the already high uh, and, I guess, everyday increasing inequalities, social and, of course, economic. This necessitates us to try and understand how green hydrogen and how a green hydrogen transition in South Africa might transpire. Uh, you know, we asked a couple of questions, particularly focusing on will we have the capabilities, development, and, of course, local linkages development to create a diversified green industrial base or we tend to have almost a repetition of the past uh, where we have export enclaves that are primarily, primarily providing green inputs into the global north industries. So in this paper, we focus uh, a few different case studies, but particularly focusing on three key sectors, and namely steel, cement, and the chemical sector. And why do you do this? Well, it's because historically these sectors reduction have ranked well above many other sectors in terms of their global greenhouse gas emissions. Crucially, two most of these sectors still feature prominently in the industrial basis of many economies, and of course, South Africa being one, uh, given, uh, a, I guess, a strong uh, discourse around the minerals energy complex. Nevertheless, the continued prevalence of these sectors in South Africa's industrial base presents both a risk and an opportunity uh, for South Africa's industrial base to try and, I guess, get onto a more productive uh, and fair path. Some of the risks include the European Union's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or the CBAM, and of course the broader umbrella of policies under the Green, industri the green uh, Deal, the European Green Deal. This is what we, at least determine in some of our other work, uh, are significant trade barriers and present significant trade barriers and potentially weakens our access to these markets, uh, which I guess can facilitate the creation and concentration of uh, green hydrogen uh, capabilities among a few players. Again, facilitating and I guess uh, fostering these uh, export enclaves. Now, from an opportunity standpoint, there is the ability to structurally transform our industrial base using green industrial green hydrogen as a uh, I guess a conduit to uh, at least in some ways, a, a degree of structural transformation. It obviously requires a much broader set of policies. Now, from the point of view of a bit more detail on the risks, you know, the uh, given that South Africa's chemicals and steel sectors have a strong export focus, these sectors are particularly at risk uh, 
to the continuation of, uh, I guess, a concentration of exports within them to uh, many of our major trading partners. Um, and if we take a look and, I guess, dive deeper into the particular political economies within these different sectors and how they came to be and how they, their power within the initial base has persisted over this time, it's important to understand this history when we're considering policies to try and, I guess, green these sectors and really try and uh, facilitate a full-scale shift away uh, from their current emitting uh, endeavors. Now, of course, if we move away from the current energy intensive resource-based sectors uh, and into higher value added sectors, this is exactly what we're trying to call for. And this is a very urgent uh, issue that needs to be understood and unpacked in more detail. Now, from the point of view of opportunities, we do recognize that green hydrogen can be a catalyst for the reindustrialization and decolonization of the South African economy. Uh, you know, if we consider the risks facing the, the, the three key sectors, without doing anything, we threaten to lock in very much an unjust future uh, if we allow future productive capabilities to be controlled among the major firms and players within these sectors. Uh, so thereby, you know, if we try and, and undergo a process of structurally transforming and decolonizing these sectors, we can aid this endeavor uh, through the development of a hydrogen economy, we feel. Now, the successful implementation of a green hydrogen economy offers one viable route for the large-scale decolonization ambitions in South Africa, notably in these hard to abate sectors of cement, uh, steel, and chemicals. And this is due to the strong linkages many of these sectors have, and, many, and green hydrogen also has within uh, a wide industrial base. I have a critical question we ask, and I think needs to be unpacked more in future work, is just exactly how this green hydrogen transition Will take place. So we, you know, we suggest will it be part of an agenda, a broad-based agenda, focusing on building local linkages to ensure capabilities, uh, in inputs for renewable energy, and to develop linkages to a diversified green industrial base. Or will we see, as I mentioned earlier, the creation and concentration of a green export enclave that very much only focuses on inputting into the greening of global north industries with little use and little uh, sale of green hydrogen in the local economy. Now, another crucial aspect uh, of such a transition is that it will be expensive. Uh, we, we do recognize that. You know, transport costs uh, is something that needs to be unpacked in, in a lot more detail and not something we particularly focus on in too much detail in this paper. Um, and the success of, such, this, of this transition in particular will necessitate an active government interventionist approach that prioritizes a market shaping versus market fixing uh, agenda that will properly develop the requisite linkages and infrastructure to green these sectors and of course the wider economy. Now, when we talk about this green hydrogen transition and framing it from a structural transformation perspective, achieving such a massive shift in our industrial base will be challenging. We don't uh, dispute that. Uh, I think even history of our history of industrial policy, we can see the, the complexities involved. Now, at present, there do exist several barriers uh, such as an immature financial landscape that has demonstrated little affinity for funding the green economy, although we do recognize that this is slowly changing. We have done some other work uh, in this regard that has shown a, a, I'd say an uptick in private sector appetite for, for green projects. Now, what this has left us with is a significant dearth in renewable energy investments uh, that has created a systemic bottleneck in transmission, storage, and balancing uh, of the energy technology mix. Uh, particularly the stop start uh, installing of the the RI triple P uh, program is a testament to this uh, and just shows how far we've actually been left behind. Now, even if these are both rectified, Africa still given its current industrial structure and the conditions uh, within these sectors and of course the global economies that facilitated their development and of course dominance over the years, we are at risk of developing a green hydrogen export enclave centered around a few large firms. But within this, we also then uh, have the risk of failing to develop domestic linkages beyond the economy's core middle industries with the sole focus of greening the European industries. Thus, we argue that it is essential to frame the green hydrogen transition from a structural transformation perspective. And what we mean by this is a perspective, one that considers 
a sector specific transitions and of course the structural interdependencies and potential for linkages development across sectors. So just in summary, just to wrap up, uh, what can we do? Yeah, well, to start, we think that in the era of green hydrogen, industrial policy must be viewed as a fundamental set of tools and policies to de-link these most egregious producing industries away from coal, while creating entirely new markets, industries, and jobs in the process. However, such a massive shift, of course, requires uh, that this requires will not be successful uh, solely through the isolated actions of public, private, and civil society actors. That we need a collective vision. Uh, and a collective action to really drive this agenda forward. And as such, we should view these challenges uh, as being terminal. And, and up there, we wrote a great green reset that rests on a few objectives that require to be integrated and aligned with a broader set of industrial policy tools and levers to ensure the successful transition of South Africa away from its dependence on coal to green hydrogen. Now, these include just the starting points, some of the, the policy uh, points we make in the paper. Uh, not not exhaustive, but just uh, about four of them or so, um, that we need to create certainty for potential investments in the transmission grid that will help us unlock the renewable energy sector and very much move past the previous stalling uh, that has hampered the uh, REI triple P and negatively impacted government's credibility. We need to try and govern, at least from its own point of view, needs to create the certainty and try and uh, claw back some of this credibility. Uh, to improve the investment set, investor sentiment around uh, green, the green economy. Of course, any GH2 or green hydrogen framework must share the ambitions and objectives of a broad-based green growth strategy. And I think we all pretty much aligned that uh, within the JET IP, for example, that this needs to be a larger social uh, program that isn't just focused on uh, industrialization. We need to look at urbanization and, of course, the socioeconomics around both of those. We must also address shortfalls in our existing grid infrastructure while focusing on exploiting the massive potential of solar and wind. These offer uh, significant potential given our just geographic positioning uh, and of course our own uh, weather climate, they offer significant potential to our decarbonization efforts, something that mustn't be ignored. I don't think many people would disagree uh, on that front. Lastly, government must seek out opportunities to work more closely with private sector leaders to more concretely locate their own green hydrogen transition as part of the wider structural transformation of the economy, particularly when you're looking at uh, the chemical sector, for instance, we, you know, some of the data shows that 90% of the emissions, South Africa's emissions are from Cecil. So very much uh, structural transformation in the chemical sector is a story of how to work with Cecil uh, and integrate their plans for green hydrogen into uh, our governmental larger economic plans. So overall, that these, uh, at least these four points must be complemented by an empowerment of a determined coalition of interest, focusing on forming a new green political settlement focused on building downstream industries whose benefits are inclusive, sustainable, and more equitably shared among a broader base of the population. Uh, we believe that through this, maybe a bit uh, kind of hairy fairy, but we believe that we can, through this, and of course using green hydrogen as our, our vehicle, that we can rebuild social solidarity and work towards reindustrializing the economy around a collective green uh, economic vision. Thanks so much. I'm going to stop over there. Great. Thanks so much for that presentation, uh, Jason. So I think what we're going to do is we'll, um, we'll save the questions uh, as for the program for after the presentations. Um, so we're going to move next um, to the presentation by Laura, uh, who uh, who's also joining us online, uh, to present on the Chilean students and um, some of the insights we get from the program in that country. So, sorry, you have to tell me how to pronounce it. Am I pronouncing your name right? Sorry. Yeah, it's it's fine. Perfect. Uh, over to you uh, with your presentation. Can you please do uh, this presentation? Okay, just let me share my screen. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my research on the green hydrogen industry in Chile here. 
Um, in the following minutes, um, I'll talk about preconditions for green hydrogen production in Chile, and then I'll elaborate on public and private sector responses to, to these opportunities, meaning um, ways in which the Chilean government tries to support the green hydrogen industry and private sector investments. Um, Chile uh, offers very advantageous natural conditions for producing green hydrogen. The north of the country, that's where I'm based, uh, has the highest solar radi irradiation worldwide. And in the very south, uh, winds are very strong, uh, so strong that uh, onshore wind turbines there are sometimes as productive as offshore wind turbines in, in Europe in the North Sea. Um, and if you look at uh, the way uh, the government presents uh, the country as a potential destination for investments in green hydrogen production, then it's very much about these natural conditions. However, um, there is more uh, to uh, more potential or other factors that make Chile an interesting location for producing green hydrogen. In the north, which is also one of the world's most important copper mining regions, there is already lots of infrastructure, ports, railway lines, roads suitable for transport of heavy bulky uh, equipment that can be used for the green hydrogen industry as well. And the regional power grid is strong enough to support at least the first green hydrogen projects and also because of the mining industry there are lots of local suppliers with a track record in mining um, meaning local companies that already meet very high standards the standards imposed in the mining industry by companies such as anglo american bhp billiton and these local suppliers could easily venture into green hydrogen offering their services and products to um, the, the corresponding lead firms chile's government uh, also has a very ambitious climate change mitigation agenda which will create a certain domestic demand for green hydrogen-based products, especially fuels. At the moment, um, Chile's domestic hydrogen market, grey hydrogen, is very small. Uh, most of these uh, 59,000 tons of annual demand are used uh, at a steel works in the center of the country, and they are also um, relatively small oil refineries so that use hydrogen. Um, but in order to, um, to provide a push for, for the industry, the mining sector in the north of the country is critical because mining needs to decarbonize itself. It has to reduce its carbon footprint because there is this scenario of the United States and European countries introducing um, a tax on uh, mining products copper especially, uh, produced with a large carbon footprint. So in order to remain competitive on global markets, uh, the mining industry has to, to reduce uh, its carbon footprint and green hydrogen appears to be a uh, means, an important means in, in that regard. Um, throughout the entire country, there are lots of other pilot projects for, for green hydrogen. It's, it's quite impressive how diverse uh, they are, um, but the key sector uh, for domestic demand in the near future is, is mining. Nevertheless, um, in the 2030s and 2040s, um, Chile's green hydrogen production will mainly be for export markets. So the government plans um, or projects that 60 to 70 percent of the revenues generated uh, by green hydrogen production will be from exports um, to Europe and to Japan. Uh, cooperation agreements uh, with ports in Europe, uh, with the Bank of Japan and uh, similar agreements uh, with other players are already in place. Um, and European lead firms have shown a clear interest in projects in, in Chile, especially in the south of the country. 
What you can see here is uh, the project, uh, projected uh, green hydrogen production from Chile's national green hydrogen strategy published in 2020. Um, this figure shows you, well, the, the main message, I guess, is that uh, there are two very big uh, black dots. Uh, that's exports, and all the small black dots are uh, production for the domestic markets. So green hydrogen in Chile is about exporting hydrogen and its derivatives. Um, the National Green Hydrogen Strategy also specifies uh, the year when compass, uh, cost competitiveness for specific applications of green hydrogen will be reached. And um, it uh, provides a certain assessment, rather wake assessment, uh, of the te technological uncertainty. So, for example, using green hydrogen uh, to fuel domestic shipping is very unlikely because there are technological challenges. Replacing green hydrogen in oil refining, uh, on the other hand, is quite likely. Um, something that I should add, uh, this is a four-year-old uh, policy plan. Um, by now, it has become clear that there will not be commercial scale production of green hydrogen before the early 2030s. Um, and the pro um, production volumes in, in million tons uh, that you can see here on, on this slide are also much too optimistic. Nevertheless, the direction export markets is still valid for, for Chile's green hydrogen industry. The public sector um, has responded to the uh, opportunities I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, by identifying key policy issues, credits and incentives for first movers have to be provided. Uh, the regulatory framework has to be streamlined. Uh, permit issuing has to be much more rapid. Um, there is need to develop in-country value chains, especially with regard to matchmaking between um, foreign lead firms, foreign investors on the one side and domestic suppliers on the other and free tra uh, trade zones in Antofagasta and Magallanes. Uh, these are the two regions where uh, most of Chile's green hydrogen is to be produced. Free trade zones for, for these parts of the country have been discussed. In addition to that, um, less important issues um, are the, the expansion of uh, infrastructure, especially in the south of the country, where there are no uh, ports that could be used for importing, for example, the components of wind turbines and where the, the power grid is not sufficient uh, to, to supply what is needed for, for pilot projects in, in green hydrogen. Then there is also a need uh, for research and development focused on the local context. For example, in Chile, everything has to be earthquake resistant and um, skilled labor has to be attracted, uh, local talent needs to be trained, especially in Antofagasta and Magallanes, which are two very peripheral regions, not very attractive as places to live and work for highly skilled, uh, skilled professionals. Much of this remains to, to be done. Um, there are lots of problems in Chile with uh, land use plans. So for example, as an investor, um, you know that there is uh, an industrial district uh, in a town called Mejillones, close to, to the city where I work. Um, and um, this industrial district is suitable for green hydrogen production but authorities can't tell you which plot of land is suitable for a, a production facility, for example. Then perhaps even more importantly, there is at present no registry of uh, Chilean suppliers capable and interested in uh, supplying products and services to, to the green hydrogen industry. The most important thing that has been achieved so far is a credit scheme largely financed by European organizations of the Inter-American Development 
and the World Bank, they provide uh, 850 million US dollars. Uh, the Chilean share is just 250 million, which is still a lot for a rather small country of 90 million people. Um, and uh, these uh, these credits are to, to uh, support first movers to help to overcome the considerable uncertainties that still mark uh, the green hydrogen industry and the quite optimistic expectation by the government is that um, this uh, this credit scheme of one billion US dollars will potentiate private invest or private credits uh, so as to reach uh, 12.5 billion US dollars for credits for green hydrogen projects. Um, as said, uh, numerous uh, transnational companies are already involved in um, pilot projects, in planning projects to produce green hydrogen in Chile. The most impressive project is in the very south of the country, in Magallanes, where Porsche and Siemens from Germany are involved uh, in, in an e-fuels plant, uh, that is to, to provide e-fuels for Europe. Projects in other parts of the country, especially in, in the north, uh, are marked by forward linkages. Uh, they are to provide inputs for the mining industry, e-fuels, also explosives. And then uh, there is this uh, steelworks in the center of the country in Valparaiso, um, which has uh, recently uh, started a pilot project uh, uh, to use green hydrogen in order to produce uh, green steel. When it comes to backward production linkages, meaning uh, the, the other key component of latecomer industrialization, um, then that is much less likely uh, in Chile, mostly because the country does not offer any economies of scale for producing the industrial inputs needed uh, for green hydrogen production, electrolyzers most importantly. All these imports uh, could be imported uh, relatively easily just for final uh, assembly in, in Chile, um, benefiting from economies of scale uh, in a country such as China. The German Development Corporation has identified um, lots of Chilean companies that could become important players or somehow participate in the wider production networks of green hydrogen. However, it is not clear whether these companies are actually interested in venturing into the green hydrogen industry. Um, small and medium-sized companies in the region of Antofagasta, uh, for example, prefer working for uh, companies from, from clients from the, the copper industry um, because um, mining companies, copper mining companies pay high prices. Uh, there are very few uncertainties regarding uh, future work in, in that sector. And that looks, of course, very different in the, the green hydrogen industry. Other challenges with regard to a development impact uh, of green hydrogen, especially uh, for, for Antofagasta and Magallanes, are, I think, first of all, um, the capital intensity of um, green hydrogen. Uh, after a short construction boom, job creation boom during the construction phase, there will be few jobs created by that industry. Uh, so labor market effects and consumption linkages will be very limited. Um, there's also uncertainty about job creation in related industries. Uh, nevertheless, there are expect expectations that that might look different. Um, generic services do matter for, uh, for Antofagasta and Magallanes. However, they do not open a pathway towards industrialization. And then there's a particular phenomenon in, in Chile, uh, in the copper mining industry, and most people work on shifts, meaning they work for seven days, 14 days, 21 days, and afterwards they have the same amount of days free time, and they don't spend that free time in Antofagasta. They fly to places in Chile, mostly in the center of the country, 
that are much more attractive to, to live and uh, they spend uh, their money there, which has, of course, very problematic effects on the, the regional economy. Green hydrogen um, will be produced in a very similar way with plants operating non-stop and people working there in, in a shift system. So long distance commuting is also a very likely challenge for regional development in that industry uh, in Chile. Coming to, to a conclusion, Chile does have significant opportunities to produce green hydrogen. Sorry. Okay, just let me come to, to my conclusions. Um, Chile does have significant opportunities to, to produce green hydrogen uh, because of the advantageous natural conditions of, well, in two regions of the country uh, and infrastructure that already exists in the north. Um, the focus will be on exports and there is a clear interest by corporations from abroad to invest in green hydrogen production in the country. Um, there are certain policy frameworks in place, most importantly this credit scheme in order to, to support the industry, um, but there are also many issues that remain to be solved. Um, perhaps most importantly, what we are talking about in Chile, and I guess that's uh, similar in, in all countries that want to, to produce green hydrogen, is pilot projects and projects that only exist on paper. There is no commercial scale production in Chile yet. Um, and there are also no, uh, no commitment by potential off-takers. No company has signed contracts to, to buy millions of tons of green hydrogen or its derivatives, which creates significant uncertainties for, for the industry. With regard to latecomer industrialization, there are numerous challenges especially with regard to backward production linkages and uh, job creation by the industry. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your comments and questions. No, thanks. Thanks so much, Soren, for that, for that input and for sharing um, some insights from the Chilean experience. Um, already, as you were going through the presentation, I can see some uh, common uh, Themes or common uh, common factors that South Africa can relate to, but also some clear uh, differences as well in terms of the focus and in terms of where the resources lie and what resources the country. So thanks so much. Uh, as I indicated earlier, we're going to take questions at the end. So we're going to move on to our final presentation uh, from Bruce, who I've introduced already. Bruce, happy to have you to come to the front and uh, run through your presentation for us. Thank you. Can I page up and down? No, uh, no so you just, uh, just have a Okay, all right. Um, well, thanks. thank you. My name is Bruce Yang. Um, I first want to start to express some gratitude that I've been invited here to talk to all of you. So I'm pleased to be able to talk to you. To talk to you. Um, I'm from the Vitz Business School, African Energy Leadership Center, which is a small group in there. Um, perhaps we can go to the next slide. Right, I'm going to start off on a, on, on a slightly humorous note. Okay, I'm going to start off with a, I was talking on a, on a humorous note. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of interest in green hydrogen at the moment. And so kind of every question you ask, green hydrogen is the answer. Um, and uh, so I'm going to, going to start off also on a lighthearted note saying I'm a little bit apprehensive here because I feel a little bit like I'm in the church of green hydrogen and I'm potentially an atheist, okay? Um, I Maybe to be fair, I'd say I'm, I'm a bit more agnostic than I am an atheist, but I have some atheist tendencies here. And um, I'm going to present somewhat of an alternative perspective. Um, I'm not an evangelist for anything. And uh, I've, uh, that the university allows me to, to express my academic freedom and I'm going to do that. Um, this forms part of a, a, a much longer presentation that I've given at other forums, 
So I'm not going to have the time to go through all of it today. I'm going to, I'm, I can talk endlessly about green hydrogen. So I'm going to jump around a bit. And then when you tell me to stop, I'll stop. Okay. So let's, let's move on to the next slide. Um, so this is an important uh, slide. And I start with this thing, you know, the heading is important. Industry, industry hype and ambitious forecasts have a very checkered history in the energy, energy industry. You need to dig deeper. So one of the things I heard was the kind of the assumption that the green hydrogen economy will happen. Well, let's just think about that carefully. Okay, so there's certainly a consensus, um, you know, from COP26 and the oil and gas industry, and hydrogen strategies I've heard, and many countries have got hydrogen strategies, so that's going to happen, right? Well, let's just think about that. Let's go into history a little bit. So in 1974, General Electric predicted that by 2000, about 90% of the United States electricity would come from fast breathers, from fast breather reactions. And it wasn't only General Electric. That was the general consensus. That's what was going to happen. Well, guess what? Nothing of the sort did happen. So just because there's consensus doesn't mean it will happen in the energy industry. It doesn't mean it won't happen, but you just need to step back and say, will this really happen? Then I'm also going to suggest to you that I'm going to guess, and if I, and if I don't hear any contradictory um, um, from, any, from anyone in the audience, I'm, I'm going to guess I'm the oldest presenter here. Okay? And so I've lived through quite a lot. Um, the current global wave of interest in green hydrogen, it's the third wave. It's not the first. It's not the second. It's the third. With earlier waves having occurred in the 1970s, that's before my time. Okay? <laughs> and the early 2000s. That's not before my time. I was part in, in Sassel at the time when there was that wave, and I was actually involved in that. So that also um, produces some skepticism in, in, in me because, oh, yeah, here we go again. Okay. Um, and the important thing is that not everyone agrees that hydrogen is the answer. And it's even been accused of being greenwashing and that it's a cult. Okay. It, now, I've provided lots of references here. So I'm not only saying what I think, there are a lot of other people out there and there are a lot of references. And so in my presentation, which I believe will go onto your website, if you don't believe me, that's fine. Remember, I'm an agnostic. Um, please go and do more reading. That's what I'm urging you to do. Um, so it can be argued that by and large, the energy future is likely to be electrical rather than hydrogen except perhaps for some niche hard to decarbonize areas. So none of the stuff I heard today was, yes, but what are the alternatives? Okay, what are the alternatives? And sometimes they're better alternatives. So it's important to look at that. Um, so the EU has recently announced to, tend to produce 10 million tons per annum of green hydrogen and import a further 10 million by 2030. Um, South African and German governments together with SASL have launched a collaboration to make sustainable aviation fuel, which is based on green hydrogen. My takeaway at the bottom there is, who is right? Are the green hydrogen evangelists right? Or are the more skeptical people like me perhaps right? Or is there some kind of answer in the middle? Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. So this is my executive summary that, uh, as I said, this is a, a slide pack that I've uh, given in a number of forums, uh, including to the students that I teach. So let me just go through the executive summary and then I'll jump around into some of the slides, uh, time permitting. Uh, green hydrogen, resurgence of interest, potential seller, uh, central pillar in the renewable energy transition. The production of green hydrogen at the multi-gigawatt scale now, we're going to talk about multi-gigawatt, okay? Not these, I saw on your slides a couple of megawatts or maybe a couple of hundred megawatts. No, no, no. These ambitions are multi-gigawatt. Much, much bigger than anything exists today. It's technologically challenging and it's capital intensive. 
the current levelized delivered cost for green hydrogen. And Mohammed, you showed a nice slide, and I have that same slide that we're talking five to six at the factory gate. But now you need to get it from the factory gate to the customer at another $3 a kilogram because hydrogen is not easy to transfer, not at all easy. So if you then just do a quick sum and say, what does $8 a kilogram mean? Well, it means $400 a barrel oil equivalent. So we're talking about a price five times um, more than the current price. So just imagine if you went to the petrol pump tomorrow and they said, sorry for you, the price is five times what you're paying now. I think the taxis would not be impressed, okay? Well, that's not entirely fair because there's a lot of tax in petrol. So, so, but I'm just saying the price will be a hell of a lot higher. And this is something you can't ignore. Um, so the forecast for dramatic de decreases in both the costs of producing and transporting hydrogen are uncertain. And I can go into detail on that. There are several competing options to green hydrogen with the direct use of green electricity being the most prominent. Very, very important point. The use of green hydrogen as a complete solution in the renewable energy transition is potentially overhyped. And because I'm trying to be balanced and whatever, potentially it is overhyped. Okay? <laughs> there are very significant mega project business and execution risks for pioneers in the multi gigawatt green hydrogen space. And then finally, I do make the more balanced statement that there is a role for green hydrogen in hard to decarbonize areas such as, as nitrogenous fertilizer. There literally is no alternative that we know about. Um, so, you know, if we're serious about decarbonizing, and we and we we need to make uh, fertilizer, which we do need to make. Well, that that appears to be the only game in town. But of course, it's going to be expensive. All right, so let's just go on. If um, Natasha, if you wouldn't mind, and we'll just pick up some topics. Um, you know, okay. Look, you've got the sorry. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. I I didn't have my contents page. Um, so let's just let's just go to the slide that I have about mega projects, and that's something I really want to. Uh, I'm not sure which number slide it is, but let's just flip through this presentation quickly and get to mega projects because that's what I'd like to talk about first. Can you just stop me? Yes, I will. There you go. So. I have scars from mega projects. Okay. I've done more than one. So there's a thing called the iron law of me mega projects. Okay. And there's a there's an academic at uh, at the Oxford Business School. And his name, okay, and I was I was corrected on the pronunciation because he's Danish. So I'll start with the incorrect pr pronunciation. Bent Fleifberg. But I've, I understand that in Danish you say bent, bent Flubok, okay? So Bent Flubok is a guru in this, and he's written books. Uh, one of these most popular books is, is, is called How Big Things Get Done. I recommend all of you read that. So let me just start with his iron law of, of mega projects. Over budget, over time, under benefits, over and over again. So let's just talk Sassel, because I spent 30 years there. Who of you have heard of the late Charles Cracker project? Okay. The CEOs were fired. Well, they, they, I think the words used were, they left to pursue other interests, okay? Um, because of the disaster of that project. So it's a textbook example of a mega project gone wrong. And that wasn't even a pioneering project. When you talk about pioneering projects, the probability of this happening is extremely high. And there are no gigawatt scale green hydrogen plants. There is only one, as far as I'm aware, and maybe one, one of you can correct me, that's actually gone past FID, and that's the project in Saudi Arabia. 
So that's a four gigawatt plant. It's uh, scheduled to start in 2026. Let's see if it actually does. And I want to focus on why. Why does this happen? And, and Ben talks about the four sublimes. And I'm an engineer. So let's start with the technological sublime. It describes, and he hasn't used the word, I use the, the, the toned down word excitement. He uses the word rapture. It's the rapture engineers and technologists get in pushing the envelope. There's nothing better as an engineer. Let's build the biggest, the newest, the most fantastic thing, because that's what you're trained to do. Okay, so you, you're not, as an engineer, you're not unbiased. Because if you get this project past FID, man, do you have fun building this thing and trying to make it operate and be one of the pioneers? But does the project, is a project success? Does it add value? Does it nearly sink the company? This is what happened in SAS. The political sublime. And here we're talking that we, I'm amongst some people, you know, who are operating in the policy and political space. Describes the tendency polit politicians have for constructing monumental infrastructures. Fantastic for politicians. Um, then we talk about the economic supply. It describes the delight business people and trade unions get, get uh, from making lots of money and jobs from mega villages. And here I refer to the service providers, not, not the owner. The service providers, the engineering contractors, everybody, the whole ecosystem around there, they are sucking in money and they're doing well. But what about the owner? And then the aesthetic sublime, I think that's, that's not so relevant in the process industries. There we talk about things like the Sydney Opera House, Opera House et cetera. And then the additional risk factors, pioneering technology, remote locations, west coast of Southern Africa, and a lack of skills to execute a mega project. These are all, we can tick all those boxes. And then, size and reputation does not help. Chevron's Gorgon LNG project in remote Western Australia, its original budget, budget was $34 billion. By 2014, costs had risen to $54 billion. This nearly sunk Chevron. Okay, so, and they are one of the oil super majors. So they're not immune. So here's my thing in bold at the bottom. Pioneering gigawatt scale green hydrogen projects in Southern Africa are virtually guaranteed to have significant cost and schedule overheads. Who is going to pay for that? If it's the South Africans and the South African government, we need to think hard about that. If we can get the German government to take all that risk, that's fantastic, okay? <laughs> so if I were on the negotiating team, I would say, not only you take all the risk, all of it, okay? We're gonna take no risk. Now, maybe that's overstating the thing, but the risks here are off the charts. Okay, so what else should I talk about now? Let's just go up a few slides and talk about transporting transporting green hydrogen. Just go up a few slides, are you going the other way? Um, up, 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 more. Uh, yes, there, there, that slide. I just want to do not spend a lot of time on this, but it's in an arena study, which I've, I've, I've referenced there. The bottom line is that if we want to transport uh, green hydrogen to Europe from South Africa, we're going to have to convert into ammonia first. Okay, so that's another big piece of capital. It's 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 a commercially proven, well-known technology. So that's not a problem. But you've got to you've got to move it in ammonia ships to Europe, and then you need to convert it back into green hydrogen if you want green hydrogen. There's a 50, there's extra capital, and there's a fifteen percent efficiency loss in doing that. So um, you need to use 15% of your green hydrogen to drive the ammonia cracking match. So, and, and then, and that's part of the reason why you're looking at $8 a kilogram. All right, then I'm going to just go down to some of Manfred Wanner's slides. 
So go down, please. No, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, I also should have seen that quicker. Oh, let me stop there. Liebrich's ladder. This way? There. Okay. I'm going to urge you all to engage with some of the critics. Michael Liebrich. He gave the keynote address at the October World Hydrogen Congress. You can go on YouTube it. His keynote address is absolutely fantastic. Um, he's come up with this thing called the, the green hydrogen ladder. And the important thing for green hydrogen is that there are many potential applications for it. I can tell you I counted them, they're 32. And each, each of those applications has its own story and pros and cons for green hydrogen. And he's been involved in an exercise of ranking and saying, which are the higher priority applications? And it's an ongoing exercise. So he, you know, it's not only him doing it, but he's engaging with in industry experts and so all I want to say about this ladder is you go from applications where green hydrogen looks like it makes sense down to applications where there are better alternatives and it doesn't make sense. So, um, and there you can see, I talked about fer fertilizer and you can see in the key there, no real alternative. Uh, you can see in the other case in the yellow, electricity slash batteries or biomass, where there are where there alternatives. And you can see a lot of the stuff in the yellow down there, there, there uh, there's an electrical alternative. And so the direct use of electricity is a potential alternative. So I, I certainly would urge you to go and, go and look at Michael Liebrich's work and to think about him. I'll also mention the Hydrogen Science Coalition. So um, you can go type that into Google and we'll come straight up to the Hydrogen Science Coalition. A lot of very interesting stuff there. All right, let's go to Manfred. One up, down, not up. Sorry, Natasha, I'm being it. Okay. More down. More down. More. No, you're going the wrong way again. Okay, sorry. Um, more down. Stop. Stop. No, no, no. There we go. There's a paper, a fantastic paper by a gold guy called Manfred Mann from the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He said, well, it's fantastic. We're going to make all this green hydrogen and we're going to use it in Europe, 20 million tons. Well, what are we going to do with it? Okay. And so he then says, he looks at two examples and he says, right, let's assume we're going to use it for uh, heavy duty trucks. And let's say we're going to have to build some you know, infrastructure for that. And so he's done some sums. If you said, right, we're going to need, uh, we're going to, need to store um, hydrogen liquid in a, pressure, in, a, in a pressure vessel, 210 cubic meters. That's a big pressure vessel. That's 10,000 10, tons per annum. He did those sums. That's what, uh, what, you know, what the service station would need to look like. Alternatively, we're going to store it at 100 bar um, and what that would take. Okay. And so, He's then said, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, have, we're gonna make this, this uh, green hydrogen, and he goes through it all. I'm not gonna go through all that detail, um, but, but let's go to the point there. The operation of the hydrogen filling station will resemble the operation of a chemical plant rather than a conventional service station. So you're not just gonna have, a, you know, uh, a few people there and whatever, you're gonna have a whole, you're gonna have an HR department, you're gonna have, engineers running this, you're going to have a maintenance department, you're going to have some, this is a serious chemical plant. Um, and, you know, handling and dealing with hydrogen is not a trivial thing. So, but whether you agree with that or not, are these service stations actually being built as we speak? Because by 2030, if, if you want to use 20 million tons of, of, of hydrogen, well, then best you start building this now. And you'll need 140 of them for Germany. So is that happening? Not so much. Okay, next, next slide. No, up one then. No, no, no. Well, there, there are two Manfred one of slides. I don't know which one will go up here. There we go. He does another analysis 
of, of using green hydrogen as an electricity storage option, because that's one of the applications that it's been talked about. And so he does a similar exercise of, well, what would that involve? Okay, what would the plant look like? And he's said, 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 you know, either a large cryogenic storage vessel of 22,500 22, cubic meters, and that's a monster, or storage of 145,000 uh, cubic meters in a salt cavern at 150 bar. And that means you have to have a salt ca cavern. So that means, you know, the geology needs to be there. The author questions the technical feasibility of this. So again, irrespective of whether this is techni technically or economically viable, if a market for 20 million tons per annum of hydrogen is to be created by 2030, decisions will soon need to be made regarding what applications the hydrogen will be used for and the projects initiated to construct the infrastructure so that it is ready in time. This is not happening. Uh, one of the previous presenters said, where's the market? Well, exactly. Where's the market? So that's just something, something to think about um, in terms of, you know, is this all going to go ha happen? And then I'm going to just go up a, up a few slides if, if I haven't been stopped from talking, because as I said, I can pontificate endlessly on green hydrogen. Do you want to go down? No, one more. That picture that I had. This one? That one, that one. Okay, and I can probably say that's my own work. Um, right. So there's a comparison. And this is what we need to do in general with applications. Okay, so I'll just talk about this one, okay, in terms of the applications. So let's say we start with one ton of green hydrogen and we compare two options of what to do with it. And the one, we say, let's make ammonia for fertilizer. And the alternative is, we let's say we use it for domestic heat. So, you know, we put it into a gas pipeline, and Europe is talking about this, and we then say, okay, so we do green hydrogen ammonia manufacturing in South Africa, um, and let's look at the, 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 the green hydrogen route in Europe. We take five, we make, um, from one ton of green hydrogen, we make 5.7 tons of green ammonia, and of course, because it's green, the CO2 emissions are zero, um, and then we compare it to the conventional route. So the conventional route, you start with methane, 18.5 tons of methane, you go through conventional ammonia production, and your CO2 emissions are 51 tons. Okay, now we do exactly the same exercise on the right-hand side for, for, for domestic heating. I'm not going to take you through all of those sums. Trust me, I've checked them, and, and uh, some of my colleagues have checked them. The amount of, 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 of uh, CO2 emissions we avoid is 5.61 tons. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that it's nine times better to make a green, green ammonia for fertilizer than it is to use uh, green ammonia for domestic heat. Now, if we assume, which I think is a reasonable assumption, that we're trying to decarbonize, we should then prioritize the applications for green hydrogen where it can make the most difference. Okay, I've used up my time. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm available to talk to you, to any of you, if you're more interested to talk to me. As I say, I can talk endlessly about green hydrogen. So thanks once again for the opportunity. Well, thanks so much, uh, Bruce, for sharing your presentation with us. And, uh, you know, critique is part of debates and discussion and progress. And I don't think we get anywhere without uh, critical reflection on the directions we're headed in and um, you know some of the key assumptions that we're making, uh, specifically when it comes to technology choices. So uh, we're at that part of the program where we're done with our presentations and we'd like to really open up the floor. Uh, we've had a couple of inputs uh, with a South Africa focus, with a Chilean focus as well. Um, so uh, really, we, we want to hear your thoughts as well and your inputs. So we open up for questions both here physically and uh, digitally online. I believe, are there, are there some questions online already? Okay, so while we're just checking, uh, while we're just checking online, um, are, there, are there any questions in the room? 
We have a very small room today. Yeah, okay. So we have a question. Please uh, introduce yourself and where you're from uh, and say who your question is for. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Tawachoki. I'm from GIZ. Uh, uh, thanks for the presentations by the various speakers. I think uh, this is quite really uh, an interesting presentation and an interesting take on all the subject matter. Uh, I do want to raise one issue, uh, especially looking at this topic from industrial industrialization perspective. And that is to say that uh, the last speaker, I think he gave a perspective which also tried to open a dimension to say that one should not be carried away with excitement about this uh, subject, uh, but there has to be some caution that this also has to be exercised. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate that approach, but my view, my, my take on it is that this is not peculiar to any uh, new industry. Uh, these are not concerns that should paralyze one from taking an action. If you are a pioneer, these are all the certain things that we have to confront because uh, we are not, uh, you know, no one is, can predict what will happen in the next, uh, the following day. But the issue that I see and what studies are suggesting that uh, it's, it's, it's like um, uh, a no regret scenario, uh, especially for a sector like green hydrogen, it has to be issues of expansion of renewable energy. Uh, and, and I'm not so sure whether that is an issue that is receiving sufficient attention in South Africa, because not so long ago when I started my career, uh, this country used to pride itself as having a cheap energy. And on the basis of having a cheap energy, it used it to drive its industrialization. It was the reason why we ended up having some of the energy guzzlers to come and set up their operations in the country. And I was hoping that as we look into green hydrogen with interest, we hope that we might be one of the exporters uh, of green hydrogen. But there will be an expansion of renewable energy because it's not it's a non-grant scenario and it has the potential to address other social economic issues that this country is confronting. So right, instead of prioritizing uh, export of green hydrogen. I thought that the starting point should be the expansion of renewable energy, and therefore other things will follow. And, and, and I'm not getting that. And this has to do with, as I said, the idea of bringing industrial industrialization into the equation. The other observation that I just want to make while I still on the floor is that the, the notion of products being produced and, and losing their competitiveness at the factory gate, it's a real concern for this country. The reason why there's a lot of of deindustrialization is precisely the sum of the factories, they make the point that they are able to produce and they can even compete with Asian producers. But the problem soon, as soon as the products leave the factory gate. So again, we need to confront that issue and see how we can become more competitive, including in rolling out the infrastructure. Because if that is not being addressed, then our problems become multiplied. So I thought I want to bring this idea of renewable energy that we need to pay more attention on expanding that. And it also has its problems, of course, when you talk about renewable energy, because I don't know one gigawatt, how much land do you require most? So there are other issues that are related to this subject of just renewable energy, let alone the next uh, challenges that the latter speaker referred to on, on, on green hydrogen. Uh, thanks. But thanks, Tavo, so much. Uh, Bruce, I don't know if you want to respond to the point about this is the normal sort of trajectory at the beginning of a, of a, of a new industry. Uh, I, I, can you want me to come out there? Or, no, you, uh, you can ask. Um, yeah, no, no, that, I think that observation is entirely correct. I would just say, okay, with whose money? If you want to do pioneering, thanks, not with my money. Okay. And if the German government's money, fantastic. If it's the if it's the South African government's money, or you know, uh, Sassel's money or whatever, well, then I would be a little bit uh, concerned. You know, if you're a Chevron, you can maybe absorb the, the, these losses. So it's with whose balance sheet 
and how is it going to be paid for and who bears the risk? Um, no, thanks. And Tabo, your other points are, are well noted, uh, specifically around the competitiveness, the land availability, and uh, the extent to which there's a scale up of, uh, of renewables. And I guess in South Africa, we have the additional constraint where we have electricity supply issues. So now when you're talking about renewable, you talk, you've got to differentiate renewables for green hydrogen production versus renewables for uh, electricity provision. And, you know, where do, where, do our, where do our priorities lie with that as well as an additional uh, constraint uh, beyond uh, the pace at which renewables are, are rolling out in, in, in the energy system. Um, so do we have any question? Any other questions on the floor? I see a question in the back there. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Shepard Ndawa. I'm from the GIZ as well. Um, I have just a question. I think um, I want to direct it to the last speaker. Yeah, I think he shared uh, some very intellectual and stimulating insights, um, particularly from the critical side of the green hydrogen technology. I just wanted to ask, um, I, 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 read, I came across something on the news, particularly in the US, where Shell shut down most of its hydrogen uh, fuel stations. Is it because they could have um, gained insight into some of the things that you mentioned? Just out of interest. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, the first thing I'm going to direct you to some literature, and then I'll answer the question to the best of my ability. Um, there's a guy uh, called Michael Barnard. You can go and find him on the internet or on LinkedIn, and he's written extensively on this, on specifically the question of this. Um, so let me answer the question myself. First of all, let's just look at thinking about passenger cars. Uh, in passenger cars, uh, Toyota have uh, come up with uh, with a fuel cell electric vehicle. It's called the Mirai. Um, it's how do we describe it? It's a complete fuel. Okay. Um, and battery electric vehicles have overtaken um, Tesla, and you know all. So battery electric vehicles in the passenger car market is already one. Um, they are, and, and and I think to be fair. Um, fuel cell electric passenger vehicles are dead. Um, then there have been a number of experiments using buses. Um, every single one of those, of those projects has failed um, for, for, for economic reasons, basically, and because battery electric buses are better. Uh, then, uh, let's say a couple of years ago, the debate between um, fuel cell electric trucks, you know, heavy duty trucks, and uh, battery electric trucks was still raging. The pendulum is also swinging in that case towards battery electric trucks, although the debate isn't over yet. Okay, so that, that debate and thinking is, is still raging, so you need to watch that space. Um, but uh, as I showed from Manfred Wanner's presentation, the challenges of, of providing hydrogen uh, on the highways and things is, is also very significant. And so I think that, you know, Shell has shut down their things, and it's a common theme that you get these hydrogen refueling stations, and what, 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 what you see with Shell is not unique. If you go dig into the literature, you will find a number of failed um, hydrogen refueling uh, stations. Great. Um, I, I want to, if there are, are there any questions or not? Uh, okay. So if there aren't, I'd like to also um, ask our other panelists uh, some questions. So Jason, uh, in your presentation, um, and I, I just wanted to get a sense from you in the context of uh, the recommendations that were made, um, what would be your reflection on the current trajectory of uh, of uh, of industrial policy thinking around green hydrogen. So we've seen, uh, you know, investment in the R and D programs through HISA. There's um, lots of feasibility projects that are happening at the moment. Uh, you know, looking at collaborations, some between the state and private sector actors as well. Do you think we're on the right path in the context of your recommendations? How do you think it's faring so far? Thanks, Mohan. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I think generally. As, as much as we know in terms of the information regarding all these different ventures and, and developments, it's easy for one to say that we're on the right path in terms of you know, heading towards the uh, kind of golden objectives of what the Green Hydrogen Commercialization Strategy and other documents of that nature 
uh, have set as their targets and ambitions, I guess it's a step in the right direction. Whether they are the right projects in, in you know, the right kind of mega projects in, in uh, Bruce's terminology, yet to be determined, I guess. Uh, and I think we always have to be uh, quite skeptical. I think, you know, some of the uh, recommendations we make in our paper in particular are necessary and probably even more important than as a precursor and precursors to any kind of green hydrogen uh, expansion uh, industrial strategy. So it's it's very much, I think we, it's a yes and no answer potentially. We are, we are heading in the right track if we understand it to be uh, the objectives and targets that are set out currently, uh, whether we will reach that uh, end goal, uh, I guess is yet to be determined. Okay, thanks. No, thanks for thanks for sharing your insights around that. We I see we do have one uh, a virtual attendee that wants to uh, ask a question directly. Maybe we can unmute. Uh, so Yudi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is it Yudi? Very uh, correct. Thank you so much. Thanks um, so much. Please, just, please Yudi, just introduce yourself and and say who your question is for. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Yudi Mabuza. I'm the Senior Science and Innovation Representative. I'm based here in Brussels and um, seconded by the Department of Science and Innovation, who are the custodians of HISA. Um, I just thought maybe it would be just good to put in some input uh, from government side. Uh, as policymakers, uh, it's very uh, good to have joined in and listened into the discussions and the presentations that give a, a holistic view of the current engagements and discussions in regards to the hydrogen economy, as well as you know other thoughts in regards to the evangelism that is going on. Um, what's important to highlight is that um, be that as it may, that we may not, or we may be able to achieve this ambitious goal, it's important to note that it is a new innovation and it is a wave that is going on at a global scale. There are different countries at different levels in uh, development of the hydrogen economy. Uh, for example, your Japan, where the main uh, custodians of uh, developing the first strategy globally, and they then put systems in place within their country in which they would be able to um, develop the economy themselves. There has been a lot of uh, very high end uh, activities on that note. They've tried some, uh, they've done some uh, feasibilities and demonstrations. And the idea is to shell, tell the world that it is doable, but it's a mega project. And the way it is so mega, it needs ultimately international collaboration and international um, inputting of joining forces in terms of resources, capacity, uh, finances, and the world at large to start re-looking and finding ways in which one can be able to uh, achieve this goal. At the end of the day, we are faced with um, a planet that is really suffering in regards to CO2 emissions. And whatever different avenues that are available that we need to look into as possible solution for decarbonization, we do have to look at those. So from government side, we are saying that it's not just the hydrogen economy on its own as a solution, but there are various uh, facets that come into play that may be able to address the decarbonization component. We do take into account as well the issues that are uh, related to just energy transition. We take into account the fact that South Africa still has a large coal reserves and how do we then look at various options of uh, carbon capture and utilization, but also carbon capture and storage. So it's multiple angles in which we're trying to deal with a global challenge in addressing societal uh, challenges. Not only do we looking at global challenges in solving these uh, challenge, uh, the, 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 the problem we're faced, but we're also looking at ways in which we address societal 
needs themselves. And in the case of South Africa, the triple challenge of poverty, uh, unemployment, and, 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 and inequality. Therefore, we have to have be part of this conversation within the global space as the current wave is going on and try and find a niche and an opportunity for the country to address its uh, problems in this regard. So I just wanted to highlight it from that perspective. We cannot be seen as policymakers and uh, or, or as doing nothing. So whether it succeeds or not, but we have tried our best in being part of the uh, finding the solution and um, providing uh, alternative options to the challenges that are currently there. I think I'll end it there, but um, there's much more information for the last presenter that I think uh, may need to get more data and some facts that could be able to help in enlightening as well on some of the global activities that have transpired and that South Africa can try to learn and uh, ensure that we are part of the uh, conversation with uh, international partners as at the stage, the world needs each other to make this a reality. Thank you. No, Yudi, thanks uh, so much for that, um, for that input. Uh, and it also, I think, gives us useful perspective into the policymaking side. Uh, and what's being uh, held as priorities. Uh, just to quickly summarize, you mentioned the importance of global collaboration, as well as the co-prioritization of other developmental goals uh, alongside uh, the development of the United Nations, like the mention of just transition, for example, uh, dealing with triple challenges, etc. Uh, thanks so much for that input. Um, next, uh, I'd like to ask, Soren, a question, just to come back to the Chilean experience. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Soren, but you did mention that there's already a high export intensity uh, with, with hydrogen. Um, is uh, from, from, from Chile, is, is Chile pursuing um, an export-led strategy? And does that have implications for the extent of domestic infrastructure investment? So, for example, uh, you know, we see um, in terms of hydrogen transport, you know, for up to certain distances, pipelines are an option. Uh, beyond a certain distance, then shipping is the only option. Uh, is there any consideration around pipelines, investment in pipelines within uh, Chile, or is it more being pushed forward as let's let's establish an export market and then uh, on the back of that grow uh, a domestic market? Thank you for uh, the question. Um, maybe to begin with, um, at the moment, there are no green hydrogen exports from Chile. Um, what we are talking about are pilot projects and mostly projects that exist on paper. Um, Chile um, has a vision of becoming a key exporter of green hydrogen and green hydrogen derivatives. Uh, that's for the late 2030s, uh, 2040s. At that time, according to the National uh, Green Hydrogen Strategy from 2020, um, 60 to 70 percent of the revenues generated by green hydrogen in Chile will be from export markets. Um, and um, whether that invests in country investment in, in infrastructure, um, not significantly, I, I, I would say, um, because most projects, um, at least in the way they are planned, have a certain dynamic of beginning with providing uh, to uh, in-country uh, clients, for example, to, to the mining industry here in the region of Antofagasta, and then as a next step of upscaling production, also exporting some of the output. And um, in, in Antofagasta, that means um, maybe 50 additional kilometers of a pipeline in order to, to get to, to a harbor where you already have facilities for exports of uh, ammonia methanol, um, because that's used for, for the mining industry at the moment. In the south of the country, that looks very different uh, because um, for this uh, huge e-fuels project by Porsche and Siemens, there are just no local consumers in the south of, of Chile. So that would directly be 
the forex sports. Uh, um, but I, I think it's very important to, to highlight that we are talking about future scenarios um, that are, of course, restricted by all the uncertainties um, that uh, the last presenter summarized. Great. Oh, thank you so much uh, for that input. Uh, Tash, I just want to see if there are any other questions online. Questions about opportunities for small medium enterprises. Uh, so, just turning to online. Um, so, let me just have a look at the questions here. Um, so, a uh, question for Soren Can you please elaborate on the late? I'm just seeing late corner industrialization effect and its potential impact on developing countries, as well as on the job creation potential. Uh, the questioner says, uh, I have seen some very wild numbers being thrown around, especially in the Saldana projects as announced in South Africa. Uh, did you get that question, Sara? Yeah, um, thanks for, for the question. Um, I mean, something that makes green hydrogen production very interesting is that there are so many potential forward production linkages and also backward production linkages. So um, if the industry develops successfully, you can link it to lots of other sectors and uh, create a big push for, for industrial uh, development. Um, I guess in the case of Sardana Bay, that's... Uh, uh, the metal processing and, and uh, something related to, to steelworks um, that might also apply to, to Chile. Um, but in that regard, there are also lots of uncertainties um, uh, at the global scale because um, what Europe and, and also Japan are interested in is imports uh, of green hydrogen derivatives, ammonia, that can then be used in order to decarbonize industries there. So Germany's chemical industry, for example, depends on these kinds of imports. Um, and there is no particular interest by the countries that will eventually finance uh, most projects, de-risk the sector, um, to have a significant industrialization or relocalization of industries from the global north to the global south. So this is, of course, in an additional uh, challenge. And um, then again, there are so many uncertainties uh, in the in the sector um, that it's very difficult to, to speculate on these industrialization effects. Perhaps as a, as a last comment, a, a difference between South Africa and Chile is that in South Africa, there appears to be more um, economies of scale. Um, Cecil is a great example, I think. Um, and these economies of scale just don't exist in, in Chile. Great. Uh, so unfortunately, we are getting close to time. Uh, I see we do have some questions. So uh, if there are any burning questions that you feel haven't been answered, please feel free to send them through to Tash. And uh, we have all of our speakers' details. We can channel them through to our speakers. And, and get you a response uh, from them. Unfortunately, we are constrained by time and uh, we're going to have to end it. So uh, in, in closing, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, uh, either virtually or physically for joining us uh, and presenting. Uh, it's good to hear different perspectives and uh, it's good for there to be debate and discussion, especially given um, the scale of ambition around green hydrogen. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees, again, physical and, uh, and virtual, uh, for joining us uh, to be part of the discussion. And uh, keep a look out uh, for, uh, for, for knowledge outputs from all of our speakers. Uh, and uh, we hope to have you at another development dialogue uh, fairly soon. Uh, wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Thanks.